Good morning. Um, so thank you for attending. Um, and I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportun opportunity to speak. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed the conference so far. There's been a very nice uh, variety of talks, and I hope to uh, make a modest contribution to that. Um, so the, the goal of this talk is to explain uh, some general methods in uh, supervised machine learning uh, from various viewpoints, from statistics and, and game theory and geometry. Um, with the goal of uh, providing a new way of, uh, of thinking about and approaching, hopefully, uh, some problems uh, in general. Um, so before I get in, I'd like to briefly introduce myself. Um, so my background is in uh, pure mathematics. So until about uh, five or six years ago, I was doing uh, research in algebraic geometry. Um, I decided to join the tech industry uh, at some point. For the last three and a half years or so, I've been at SignalFX. So we're a, a metrics monitoring and distributed tracing platform for uh, monitoring uh, cloud infrastructure uh, and, and producing alerts. Um, but the talk will have not so much to do with uh, work related to that. OK. Is the sound all right? OK. I'm, I, I'm hearing some whisper. Maybe that's me. Um, OK, so the, the overall goal is to uh, describe some general concepts from uh, supervised machine learning uh, with an eye towards decision trees and ensembles of such. Um, and then I'll try to, to view these particular methods uh, from the viewpoints of statistics, uh, game theory, and then dynamical systems uh, and geometry. Um, so there are some parts of this that may be a bit dry, but I promise that there are pictures at the end, um, unless, you ask, unless you ask too many questions and, and we don't get to those slides, but there will be some pictures. Um, OK, so uh, just as a, as, a, as a brief reminder or, or context setter, um, the, the overall idea of supervised machine learning is to use data to fit a function that describes some outputs of interest uh, as, as a function of the inputs uh, which can be observed. So for example, uh, fraud detection can be modeled as such a problem. Uh, given an incoming transaction on a credit card, say, you would like to uh, infer or guess uh, from various attributes of that transaction, like what is the history of this card, what is the history of this merchant, how likely is this uh, transaction to be fraudulent. And you know, very quickly, you have to make a decision about whether or not to, to let it go through. Or maybe you're giving loans to people, and you need to decide, uh, based on their credit history and other attributes, um, which you are legally allowed to consider, the likelihood of default, whether or not they're, they're likely to, to pay you back. So there are many problems which can be modeled in this way, but the, the general mathematical framework uh, is that we're trying to learn a function from some inputs that can be observed to some outputs that we care about. And so for simplicity, I'll focus on the two-class classification problem, which is to say that the output uh, is discrete or categorical rather than continuous, and we'll assume the input space is a, is a d-dimensional Euclidean space. So hopefully you can model your way into this situation and use this to uh, handle multi-class uh, problems if, if that's what you're uh, facing. Uh, and I will then further focus on uh, algorithms that use as a base uh, decision tree. So, um, so the basic idea of a decision tree is that you cut your Euclidean space uh, into regions using a binary tree of coordinate inequalities. So the root node will say something like, the first coordinate is less than three. And if that's true, you go to the, to the left child. And that will give you some other coordinate and some other threshold. And if, if not, uh, you will go to the right subtree. And you'll keep traveling along this tree. Uh, and then eventually, you'll get to a terminal region. And that will tell you something to do, like vote class one or vote class minus one. That's kind of the, the, abstract, uh, the abstract definition. And then, of course, there are all these problems about Given a data set, how do you produce one of these trees? And then given an incoming, incoming example, how do you use this to make a decision? But sort of the, uh, the abstract framework is a, a binary tree of coordinate inequalities on Euclidean space to, to, uh, uh, to distinguish two classes. OK, are there any, any general? So this is kind of the background. Um, I don't expect you to have learned all of this in the last minute, but are there any questions at this moment? Um, it, it's the set of uh, d-tuples of real numbers. I'm not sure what else to say about it. So you just, you're, the, the point is that you're allowed to have lots and lots of features that describe your inputs, like uh, velocity, different types of velocity measurements and different attributes of the, of the merchant. So it's the, usually the job of the data scientist to produce some gigantic feature space, and then the machine learning algorithm is, is supposed to say, these are the ones we care about, and this is, a, this is the decision rule that describes the output as a function of these possibly very many inputs. OK. 
Um, okay, so generally uh, a single decision tree is sort of terrible at making decisions um, for a lot of reasons. Um, and so there's, uh, there's an interest in uh, using them uh, as a basis for, for forming uh, better classifiers or, or better regressors. Uh, and so as a general motivation for ensemble methods, I'd like to explain to you how to, so I used to, I used to teach, um, if you have a class of C students, um, I probably shouldn't say anything else about my teaching history, um, how you can make, a, make an A plus out of this. Okay, so let's say you have a class of uh, 50 students and they all score about 70% uh, on your true false exam. And somehow they're allowed to vote on each question, definitely not allowed. Um, but if you allow them to vote and just take the majority vote as the, as the guess for that question, what will they score? Okay, will it be about 70%? Will it be much better? Um, hopefully it shouldn't be worse. So what is the probability that the majority of students is correct in this situation? Okay, well, assuming the errors they make are independent, which is a huge assumption, we can use the fact that a, the sum of a bunch of independent random variables should be pretty close to its expected value. So in particular, if we have uh, n independent Bernoulli random variables, so Bernoulli just t is, t can take value zero or one, it takes uh, value one with probability p, and value zero with probability one minus p, then if you take n of these and add them up, you should get p times n. That's about what you should get. Um, and of course, there's, uh, if, if you do a little bit of extra work, you can, you can study how likely this, this sum is to be far from p times n, and uh, one way to do, to do this is to apply uh, Hofding's inequality. And so what this says is that the, the probability that the sum of these n independent random variables differs from the expected value p times n by more than some epsilon times n, where epsilon is, is quantifying the error, is less than or equal to something which is exponential in uh, n, which is the, the sample size, okay, times this minus two and, and the square of the epsilon. Okay, so it's describing for you. So of course we expect p times n, and this is saying, well, what is the probability of having a certain deviation from that? Well, it's this, uh, it's this exponential term. Okay, so this is something that we can, uh, we can just evaluate then. Um, so our, for our uh, particular uh, numbers, we can say, well, we have 50 students, that's n, and the probability of being correct is uh, 70%, so, so p is 0.7. So I, I, I put these numbers in for you, hopefully you believe me, but anyway, you get, um, uh, that the probability is less than or equal to ep the exponential of minus 100 times the square of the error. Now, since we are, uh, since I said we're 70% uh, correct on average, uh, we can afford for, we, we can afford to miss, uh, to be off by about a fifth. That, that's what we would, uh, in, in order to, uh, in order to still have a majority be correct, right? Because uh, there's a fifth between 70% uh, and 50%. So the, the probability that the majority is wrong on a given question uh, can be obtained by setting epsilon equal to one-fifth in the, in the preceding inequality. And then you get the exponential of minus four, which is a little under 2%. Um, so you expect a grade of over 98. That's pretty good, um, at least in all the classes uh, I ever uh, taught or, or, uh, or attended, uh, that, was, that was probably an A. So all you have to do is get these 50 students uh, to make independent errors. So maybe you assign them different sections of the, of the book, um, or, or somehow you get them to, uh, to produce errors which are independent, and then as long as you can get them to, to vote, uh, you can produce a better result. Okay, so, if, so this motivates uh, various ways of combining uh, machine learning classifiers, uh, which may not, may not be so, so great on their own, but which are a little bit better than random, maybe not 70%, and whose errors can be made independent. Okay, and there are, there are two general frameworks for making, uh, for, for forcing classifiers or encouraging classifiers to make um, independent errors. And so they're generally called boosting uh, and, and random forest. So I'll, I'll first mention the, the framework of the Adaboost algorithm. So the idea here is to, to reweight the training set based on the errors that you've, that you've uh, accumulated so far. So you first weight your training set with, uh, with every point receiving an equal weight, an equal fraction of one. And then for some number of iterations, you fit a classifier to that training set. For example, you fit a decision tree to that training set. From that, you compute its weighted error rate. So how bad is it taking into account the weights? And from this, you extract a coefficient. 
And then you use this to reweight the training set so that you encourage the next classifier to focus more on the examples that you've gotten wrong so far. Okay, and you keep, you keep going for some amount of time, say capital M, and then uh, at the end you output something which is just the sign of the weighted sum of the individual classifiers that you obtained. And so generally, uh, at least if you, if you read this in the standard textbooks, you'll see this presented uh, with the particular case of the GMs being decision stumps, which is a decision tree with a single node. So it's a single feature and a threshold on that. You say if X5 is bigger than three, vote yes. If otherwise, vote no. Okay, but so you can't make very good decisions just using those, but if you form linear combinations of them uh, using this procedure, it turns out you can make um, much better decisions. Okay, so the idea is to deliberately uh, force the next classifier to focus on the errors that you have so far. So that's boosting or adaptive boosting. Add a boost, so short. Um, and then the idea of the random forest is somewhat different. So here uh, we encourage randomness, um, we encourage independence rather just by using randomness. Um, so in this situation, we, we are again producing a collection of trees and each one is trained on a different sample from our training set. And bootstrap just means that we sample with, uh, with replacement. And then uh, we don't consider all of the features all the time. At each node, we consider only a random subset of the available features. So it may be the case that X10 is really powerful at distinguishing the two classes, but we only consider 5% of the available features and we're not gonna get that all the time. And then the, the number of features uh, that you consider at each split is then the main thing that controls uh, how, this, how this ensemble behaves. But in general, you just take uh, a bunch of bootstrap samples and uh, random subsets of the features, train the trees on those, and then use, uh, and, and then use an unweighted voting to produce, uh, to produce a prediction rule uh, from the collection of decision trees. Okay, and so the hope is that they'll be independent because they're trained on uh, different random subsets and because they consider at each node a different subset of the available features. So if, something, if, a, if a phenomenon survives this process, then surely it's real. Okay, any, any questions about these two general approaches? So one's very deliberate and focused and one's like, I don't know, let's just, let's just take a bunch of random stuff and average it out. Um, which, which actually works. Um, so, um, so we can think about uh, why these work or how they work um, using a, a more general idea of the, the bias variance uh, decomposition. And this basically describes the two principal sources of error uh, when, you're, when you have a, a classifier. So basically a classifier is unbiased if you expect the correct answer on average. And then the variance describes how stable the prediction rule is. So how much can the answer or the prediction change if I change the input a little bit? Okay, and so you'd like to have zero for both of these, but that's usually not possible. And so if you have too much variance, then the predictions you make or the decision rule can vary wildly based on changes in the input. So you have a possibility of overfitting. Whereas if you use a model that's too simple, you'll probably have something with very low variance, but extremely high bias. So if the, if the particular model you produce, like a simple linear model or a decision stump, uh, doesn't actually describe the phenomenon that you're trying to model, then that's a, that's a source of bias. But generally, we are, um, we are okay with a little bit of bias if, if, we, can, uh, if we get a, a, good, a good reduction in variance. Okay, so this is kind of a general phenomenon having, that doesn't, doesn't apply only to decision trees, but this is a way to view the, the, ensemble, the ensembling procedures. So the random forest can be, can be viewed as a way of reducing variance. So if you train individual trees which are extremely deep, say go down until you can't even split the data anymore, the individuals will have extremely low bias but very high variance. And if you average them, hopefully you keep the bias low and reduce the variance. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. Whereas boosting uh, is generally, at least with decision stumps, uh, I didn't make up that term, by the way. I think it's hilarious, though. Um, the individuals you, you, you produce are extremely high bias because it's very unlikely the thing you're trying to model is, can be described by a single feature and a threshold on it, but also very low variance. So you can change the input and you're gonna get this, this, the same decision rule if you've just picked a single feature and threshold. 
And then the iterations of boosting, where you change the weights and train additional uh, decision trees, can be viewed as reducing the bias. And then you may have some concerns that uh, if you do this too many times, you will introduce variance and therefore overfitting. Um, but one thing we'll, we'll see later is that deep trees may be okay to use uh, in the boosting framework. Um, and in any case, there may be a type of convergence uh, for, the, for the boosting procedure. Okay. So now I'll, I'll move uh, to, to some more um, specific statistical arguments for, uh, for, the, for the random forest, uh, or for, for, the, for, the, the, uh, for analyzing trees in general. Um, and this, some of this is drawn from a paper by uh, Leo Bryman. So again, we, we give ourselves this context of a, of a two-class problem on a d-dimensional Euclidean space, and we use uh, decision trees which have a certain number t uh, of terminal nodes, and each node is a, a one-variable split. Okay, and then one thing uh, Bryman uh, proves in this paper is that uh, the, class of, uh, the class of trees is complete in the sense that you can basically approximate any function as long as the number of nodes is larger than the dimension of the input space. Okay, and the, the main idea of this proof, so it only, it only takes a page, I think, uh, is to construct an indicator function for a d-dimensional rectangle, which is to say a function which is one exactly on that rectangle and zero everywhere else. So as soon as you have this, you can produce, uh, you, you can approximate uh, any function, uh, at least with respect to the, um, the L2 norm. And so in particular, if you can approximate anything, uh, you can find some linear combination of decision trees uh, that converges to any minimizer of the expected loss function, which is the, the thing that's driving the, uh, the training procedure. Okay, and so uh, when people talk about um, neural nets, they often talk about these uh, so-called uh, universal appro approximation theorems, and whenever you introduce a new one, you generally prove some approximation theorem, so this is the, the analog of that for decision trees, or for, for ensembles of decision trees. Yeah, you, can, you can approximate any function with this class, provided you're allowed uh, linear combinations. Okay, so that tells you that there is a way to, to combine decision trees that minimizes the, the loss function, but it doesn't tell you how to find one, so like, we need some, some algorithms. And so uh, now I'll sort of combine arguments that, that Bryman gave with some uh, sl slightly uh, more specific and maybe cleaner arguments. Uh, from a paper that, that tries to interpret statistically uh, the adaptive boosting procedure. So the, the general idea is that you wanna produce a function which is, say, very large on class one and very large negative on class minus one. So you wanna separate the two classes with this, some function, capital F, that's defined on your input space, which is a, a d-dimensional Euclidean space. So there are many ways to formulate this as an optimization problem. Uh, one way is to say uh, that you'd like to minimize the uh, expected uh, uh, exponential loss, which is the exponential of minus uh, y times capital F uh, over all of the training set, where I'm thinking of an individual example as a d-dimensional vector x and a plus or minus one uh, label y. Okay, and this kind of fits with the description above because uh, the, the contribution to that uh, expectation for class one is the exponential of minus F. So if I want that to be small, I want F to be really freaking huge. And if y is minus one, the contribution is the exponential of f, so I want, I want capital F to be a very large uh, negative thing so that, so that I don't get a large contribution to the loss. Okay, so that's, that's one way to formulate it. Um, and then you can try to think of this uh, uh, producing a solution to this or an approximate solution by, by an iterative procedure. So assume you have some way of initializing this, you have some capital F, we like to find a good update. We wanna add something to our, to our, to our uh, candidate solution F and make it a little bit better. Okay, since we don't know how to optimize anything, um, but we know how to handle polynomials, um, the approach is to uh, use a Taylor expansion uh, of, the, uh, of the expected ex exponential loss, which was on the previous slide, and use that to find the optimal uh, update little f. And it turns out that that can be described in a fairly simple way uh, in terms of the labels of the, uh, of the, of the points in the, in the data set weighted by the exponential of uh, minus y times uh, the current capital F. So that kind of works for any value c. 
And then uh, once you know the, the solution that works for NEC, you can find the coefficient C that works best for it. And that turns out to be, uh, to echo the, the coefficient that you saw on the, on the first slide, uh, the first slide, first slide that explained uh, the adaptive boosting procedure. Okay, so from, for, theor for sort of abstract uh, theoretical reasons, we know that we can find uh, a, good, uh, uh, a good linear combination of decision trees in terms of minimizing the expected loss. But that's a gigantic space. The space of all functions on a d-dimensional Euclidean space um, is too large to just throw some algorithm at. And so instead, uh, we say, well, let's find a way to start and find a way to uh, produce incremental updates uh, which, which make our solution better. And that turns out to be um, a statistical characterization of what the, the boosting procedure does, um, which was not available at the time the, the boosting procedure was first um, introduced. Any, um, any questions on this? So I'm about to move to the kind of game theory approach, but any, any questions so far? Is there some intuitive explanation for why the log of the probability ratio has some inherent to um, I'm not sure if there's any intuition. Um, it's, it's more of a, a computation. Um, it just comes from, from calculus. Um, so I think in a, in a lot of places, I mean, it's related to the exponential, um, and, the exp and the same sorts of arguments can work uh, for different choices of loss function. It just happens that when you use the exponential loss, you get this particular uh, collection of formulas. Um, but the particular formulas are maybe not as important as the, as the general approach of, of uh, defining some, uh, some loss function and then optimizing it by this, um, uh, by this incremental uh, iterative procedure. Yeah. Uh, what kind of uh, convergence rate falls out of it? In terms of, you know, uh, the next term that drops out, whatever things that's not accounted for, that kind of stuff? Um, so the, oh, maybe I should repeat the, the, the question is about the convergence rate. So, uh, so this particular argument just uses the Taylor expansion of de up to degree two. Okay. And then it turns out that the degree two term doesn't really matter. Um, so it becomes a, a much simpler problem. Yeah, so we can't do anything except polynomials, so we just pretend that the higher degree terms don't matter. Um, I think the, I mean, you can bound the, just by, by general calculus, you can bound the size of the error, um, and then in a particular case, that may or may not be acceptable. Okay, so uh, let's have a, a slightly different view uh, of this uh, boosting, uh, boosting procedure. Um, so this view comes from uh, game theory, uh, a paper called Prediction Games, or Predictions Games, that looks like a typo. Um, so uh, first we define uh, a couple of quantities. So if we have a bunch of weights and a bunch of classifiers, again, possibly resulting from a boosting procedure, then we can define the margin at some input as uh, the, the weighted, basically the, the weighted correctness minus the weighted error. Okay, so the, the capital I is just an indicator. So uh, for, every, for every example where the classifier is, is correct, I give myself positive that weight. And for every example where it's wrong, I subtract, I subtract that weight. Okay, so that defines the margin at some input. And then, uh, and then you can uh, produce the weighted error of the classifier as a whole. Okay, so now um, you, can think of, uh, you can think of this setup uh, from the standpoint of two adversaries playing against each other. So here's a, here's a game. Um, does anybody want to play? So uh, we, we fix a set of available classifiers, okay, GM. So these could be anything. They could be decision trees, um, and that's what we'll apply it to, but the, the framework, framework is somewhat more general. So the game goes as follows. Player one chooses a training sample, like row three, a particular transaction on a credit card. And player two chooses a bunch of weights for the classifiers. And then player one wins the weighted error uh, associated with that weighting and that training example. It sounds so, like so much fun. Um, so uh, in this situation, you can, um, you can see, uh, you can construct a so-called payoff matrix. I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, it, it's kind of a crappy matrix anyway. Um, but basically, the columns correspond to uh, classifiers and the rows correspond to training examples. And it's just telling you uh, what, happens, uh, what happens in that example. So in other words, does the classifier get it, get it right or wrong? So the first entry is one if the classifier gets it correct, um, and, minus, and the second entry is minus one, um, otherwise, uh, otherwise the other way around. 
Okay. And then in this situation, um, there's a so-called mixed strategy equilibrium by, by general results in, in game theory. Um, and what this means is that uh, player one, well, you can't just announce the sample you're going to pick, because someone can beat you very easily, but you can announce a probability measure on the training samples. And player two can so announce a sort of probability measure, which we're thinking of as a weighting on the columns. And neither player will have an incentive to change their strategy. And furthermore, uh, you can describe the value of the game, or the expected value of the game, the expected gain for player one or loss for player two. And it's exactly uh, this uh, minimum, maximum, or maximum, minimum uh, margin. OK, so this gives you another, another way of thinking about uh, the, the classification problem in general and how to make a weighted collection of uh, classifiers, which individually may not be so good. And now you think, OK, I understand what the boosting procedure is doing. It's trying, to, uh, it's trying to play this game. It's trying to increase this margin. So why don't we just do that directly? Like, why do we mess around with all this, uh, with all this calculus? Why don't we just try to, uh, the calculus as described earlier, why don't we just uh, maximize the value of this game? Like, let's just do that. Well, uh, Bryman did that. So you think you know what the algorithm is doing. You just try to, to do it directly. Um, and of course, the result does have better margins, because that's the thing you're optimizing. But its generalization error, at least in the, in the examples that, that he considered, were worse uh, than the boosting procedure. So it's a kind of a fascinating conundrum. Um, you can say that, yes, yes. So it could just, yeah, so it could be that or it could just be that it has more bias, actually. Yeah, there's the, yeah, there's both the, the error on the, on the test set and how much that differs from the error on the training set. And I, I don't remember exactly how that decomposes in this example. OK. No more games. OK, so now um, we move to uh, some ideas from uh, dynamical systems. Um, and so the, the, the general idea of, of this paper and, and this view of the boosting algorithm is that uh, we will show that uh, certain, uh, certain functions of the weights uh, converge as we continue to boost. OK, as long, basically as long as the, the number of boosting iterations is very large compared to the size of the input set. OK, and if the weights converge, then any interesting quantity you would want to know about the classifier will also converge. For example, uh, its generalization error. And so the idea is to view it as a dynamical system and then uh, hope that some theoretical conditions uh, can, be, can be shown to hold, at least in some examples, uh, and, and then apply some theorems guaranteeing convergence. OK. So, so what we'll do is fix a training set of some size, uh, still capital N, and also a hypothesis class. So a hypothesis is something like, um, uh, it, it could be described in terms of uh, inequalities on the, on the coordinates. Okay, it's just a, another way of formulating the same, uh, same idea. And so once you have a collection of hypotheses, um, this determines for you um, some available uh, mistake dichotomies, which is to say, uh, just a label for each uh, training example, uh, was this hypothesis correct or incorrect on that example? Okay, so a parameter space for how to be disappointed in the classifier. Okay, and there's also a, a state space, uh, which is the collection of weights you can put on the training examples. Uh, this is a, an n-dimensional simplex. Okay. And then we assume specified, uh, for example, by the boosting procedure or something else, um, a learning function which says, Given a labeled training set and a, bunch of, and a bunch of weights, choose for me a new hypothesis. And then, of course, once we have that hypothesis, we can see uh, where is it wrong. OK. And there's a, a little bit of uh, geometry. So you can think of the, the procedure of hypothesis selection as partitioning the, the simplex into different regions. So for some available, uh, for some mistake dichotomy, you can ask, what are the weights for which uh, this, this dichotomy is best? And this will chop up your simplex into some pieces. Um, and I probably won't be able to explain exactly how this, how this is used. But the, the, the basic idea is that every time you update the weights, you can view this as applying some function uh, from the simplex to itself. 
So you select the best, uh, you have a bunch of weights, you select the, be the best hypothesis, um, you, see where, you see where its errors are, and then you use that to do a reweighting. So that whole procedure can be described as a function from the simplex to itself. And then uh, if you're, uh, I'm not an expert in dynamical systems, but uh, when, you have a, when, when you're in this situation, it's, it's common to define the so-called attracting set, which is the set of points that can be uh, written, so again, sorry, we, we take the open subset of the simplex, um, which, which can be written as, a, as uh, the result of applying an arbitrary number of uh, iterations of this procedure uh, to a point in the interior, so-called attracting set. So where would the stuff go if you kept uh, inside the simplex, where would, everything, where would everything be attracted to if you kept applying this uh, weighting, this, this add a boost uh, rule over and over again? Um, and then some general theorems uh, imply that uh, certain functions, uh, uh, certain functions in this case of the weights, will converge. In particular, the, the decision boundary and the generalization error uh, will converge as the number of boosting iterations uh, increases. Okay, so in the interest of time, maybe I won't, I won't mention the details, um, but it's kind of a, a nice idea to see uh, what are the uh, theoretical conditions that would imply the, the convergence of the boosting algorithm, and then how do you actually check those uh, in some particular example? Right, it's not, that, that's not so clear. Okay, but one thing that emerges from this is that if you believe that the boosting procedure converges, then you can kind of say that uh, the random forest and boosting procedures are the same in the sense that they are both drawing trees from some distribution and then uh, predicting when two things, predicting uh, based on uh, in what terminal node or in what terminal nodes an example belongs to. Okay, so in, in the random forest and then maybe also the boosting procedure, um, if you believe the convergence result, uh, the probability that two examples land in the same node can be expressed as a, a sum over the a sum over the terminal regions, um, and then a bunch of draws uh, from the distribution from which the trees are drawn, from which the trees are uh, created. Um, and if we uh, and if we have this view, then it appears that the, all of these tree methods can be views, viewed as kernel methods. So if we denote this uh, probability by, by capital K, then the decision rule can be described in terms of uh, the result of uh, you know, fixing the first coordinate at, at X. And then you can try to study the shape of this kernel as you vary the, the way you construct the trees. So in one version, uh, so in one version uh, you might say, I will choose a completely random uh, feature and a completely random value threshold for that feature. And in that case, the kernel will not have any preferred directions. So that the, the probability uh, uh, or, or the proximity to some, to some little x uh, in, in terms of this, from the viewpoint of this random forest, will basically be a function of the distance to that point. So it won't care exactly where you are, it'll just want to know how close you are. The further away you are, the less likely you are to land up in the same node as that little x. As you get closer, you're more likely to land in the same terminal node as that x. But there doesn't care about the direction, it only cares about the distance. And in this situation, the kernel is symmetric, and the individual classifiers that you produce will be uh, highly uncorrelated with each other, but not so strong. And if instead you try to do uh, something slightly more intelligent at each node, something more deliberate, um, the kernel will become more skewed. And that's because the, the terminal regions are trying to be more pure, to, be, to look like mostly class one and very little of class minus one or the other way around. And in this case, the individuals that belong to the ensemble are better classifiers, but they are also more correlated with each other. Okay, and now some pictures. Um, so here's, after all this theory, it's a, it's a, we're trying to distinguish the inside of, inside of a circle from the outside of a circle, like what is going on? Um, but anyway, this is, the, this is the example that is hopefully rich enough to, to show uh, some of these ideas. Um, so yeah, so we're trying to distinguish the inside from the outside of a circle, uh, but using cuts which are um, uh, parallel to the axes, so it's not so clear you can do this. Um, so in, in one approach, uh, we'll use a, on the, it'll be the left-hand side, we'll do the, we'll use a, a random forest where we choose a feature at random, by the way, there are two features, and then we'll pick the best split for that feature, the one that best separates the classes. And then we have an even randomer forest to be seen on the right, where we choose a random feature, again, there are two, and then a random value for that feature. 
Okay, and then we, we use this as, a, as an input to the general uh, random forest machinery, or the, the general random tree machinery. Um, and, then, and then I'll throw away some of the easy examples just to, to, to bring into focus the interesting stuff. So uh, on the, on the left-hand side, you can, uh, you can hopefully see that the decision boundary is increasing or changing very rapidly in a, in a neighborhood of the, of the circle. So it's very tight around the, the, around the actual decision boundary. And that's because we are being a little, more, a little bit uh, more deliberate about how we make our individual decisions. So we're choosing a feature at random, but we're choosing the best threshold. And so the kernel is kind of skewed, or it takes into account the structure of the decision boundary. Whereas on the right-hand side, where we, where we pick a feature and a threshold at random, the kernel looks a lot more like uh, uh, blobs which are symmetric, uh, which are rotationally invariant at least, um, about each point. And if you think about making a decision rule out of those, it's going to be harder to, to cut. Uh, it's going to be harder to have a sharp cut uh, around this decision boundary. So you'll still be able to distinguish the two classes, um, but the way the, the decision function changes will be more gradual in a neighborhood of the decision boundary. OK, and then you can also examine where they disagree um, above a threshold. Um, and so the, the last thing I want to, um, uh, I want to mention is uh, this. Uh, Conundrum, which is that um, these procedures tend to uh, perfectly fit the training data and yet have a uh, small generalization error. Um, and so um, maybe I'll just uh, immediately go to some uh, pictures of, of boosting. Okay, so it's the same, uh, same type of example. Um, and now we again just have a decision uh, stump. Okay, so we're trying to distinguish the inside from the outside of a circle with one, uh, with one cut. Uh, which, is, which is parallel to the axes, so not much you can do. Somehow you break the symmetry and choose one. Okay, now you increase the weights on the examples where you got it wrong. So where's the next one going to be? On the other side, great. You're doing better. So on the, on the left side, you have the decision, uh, the, the probability, and on the right side, you have it uh, cut at some threshold. Um, I think I made the classes equally weighted, so it's probably cut at 0.5. Um, now let's keep going. I want to. I want to keep boosting. Okay, you do a couple more. You cut off the top and the bottom. So now you're you're trying to approximate a circle with a square. Are you done? No. So you keep going to ten iterations. You start to slice off a little bit more, um, and then at hundred, it kind of looks like a circle. So you somehow we've come up with a, a weighted uh, a weighted linear combination of cuts which are uh, parallel to the axes, which basically look like a basically looks like a circle. OK, and then the very last topic, um, for which I have one minute, is uh, a study of how the boosting procedure behaves, in some example, as you increase the depth of the base learner. So in the iterations I've, uh, I've shown uh, in this example, where we're trying to distinguish the inside from the outside of a circle, I use the decision stump. So just one, one feature, one threshold. Um, now let's, let's study how, in a, in a different example, how the behavior uh, varies as a function of the depth. Okay, so I, I, draw, uh, I draw my uh, inputs from a 20-dimensional square, and then I have a certain probability of being class one, which is some formula based on the, which basically depends on the first five coordinates, otherwise I'm class minus one. Okay, and then, um, so I don't, is this visible? So uh, the, the cyan color uh, uh, is, is depth one, that the legend is telling you the depth um, the uh, vertical axis is the error, so lower is better, and the horizontal axis is the number of, of boosting iterations. So if you just focus on the cyan, that's telling you how this behaves uh, for depth one uh, base learner, and so initially it's better. And then if you look at the uh, dark blue, that's depth three. It starts out worse, and then it gets better. The green is depth five, and the red is depth 10. And so initially, the, using the decision stumps or shorter trees in general, uh, has a better performance, but as the number of iterations uh, increases, uh, the performance actually gets better for the deeper tree, the boosting ensembles created with uh, deeper uh, decision trees as a, as a base learner. Okay. Uh, one of those stops is actually trending upward as you increase iterations from 1,000 to 2,000. Uh, that's, that's right. Um, so, they, so we could keep going. I believe that they will all become basically horizontal lines. Um, it would be great if they would all get better as the number of uh, iterations uh, increases, but that's not true. 
So, yes. Yeah, and I did this once on a, on a single data set. You're supposed to you're supposed to do this lots of times and produce confidence errors and confidence uh, intervals and such. Yes? Um, so uh, my understanding is, so the question is how this compares to X, XGBoost. So, um, so my understanding is that, uh, so I, I don't, I'm not familiar with all the details of XGBoost, but it's essentially a form of adaptive boosting uh, with a lot of uh, nice heuristics built in for, uh, to make the tuning uh, easier. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what, um, uh, what algorithmic novelties there are. Um, but it, it very much fits into, this, uh, fits into this framework. So that's it. Yeah, I'm happy to stick around for questions here or, or elsewhere. Yeah. 